Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. I uh, quite uh, I feel honoured that uh, that you will give me your time, and I know night terms time is precious, so uh, thanks for that. Um, let's see if this works. The matters that we're going to go through, if uh, we've got a lot to go through here, because uh, it's hard to go through a three hundred page document in in under an hour. Uh, so I'm just going to go through the basics, um, uh, basically talking about what are risks and some of the terms in the international standards, because when I'm talking about risks and hazards and safety and all that, I'm talking about some very specific things. Uh, and when does it become a risk? Um, what can we do for safeguards to mitigate the risks? And then we go into a series of specific hazards and safeguards that are dealt with in the safety standard that, uh, that, that, that my committee uh, has released in Australia. Uh, at the end of all that, we'll talk a little bit about what you've got to do to go to market, because it's not just a matter of meeting the safety standards, there's a whole bunch of things you need to do. And we'll sum up, and if we've got time, we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, firstly, uh, a brief disclaimer, you've had the introduction about who I am, but uh, this presentation's got my own opinions. And, uh, you know, if you've got specific issues that you need to deal with, you really need to get expert advice about those, uh, because this can only ever be an overview and a summary. And, of course, things are, uh, from my perspective, not from anybody else's. So. Uh, it doesn't necessarily represent the views of IBM or anybody else who's mentioned in this presentation, although I have taken care in, in developing it. Okay, so some of the, well, pretty much all of the safety risks we've identified from electrical articles in the International Safety Committee, TC 108, uh, uh, the hazards on the left side of the screen, there's electric shock, there's fire, there's materials and chemicals hazards, mechanical hazards, thermal burn hazards and radiation hazards. Um, and what we mean by hazards is defined by ISO and IEC in Guide 51, which is a guide for technical committees to write safety standards. So a hazard is a potential source of harm doesn't mean that actually harm has happened. But the harm that we're talking about is injury or damage to the health of people or damage to the property or environment. That can include fire as well as personal injuries. The risk is how likely is it that that harm will occur and how, bad, how badly affected or what's the severity of that harm and you can't make anything perfectly safe. There's going to be some residual risk for everything. You mightn't believe it, but there is. And uh, so residual risk is the risk that's remaining after protective measures have been taken. But we've got to reduce that residual risk down to tolerable levels that are accepted by society, by regulators, consumers, and people who are using the equipment. And safety, at the bottom of all that, is freedom from risk, which is not tolerable. So reiterate, we can't have complete safety. There is always going to be some residual risk, but we've got to manage that to a level that people consider to be safe. So what, what are the risks? And a lot of these charts are pretty busy, but a risk is where energy can transfer that can cause pain or injury. And it can be to an energy transfer to a body part, or it can be energy transfer to flammable materials that can cause fire. So we need to consider how much energy there is in the energy source and consider the body part or fire susceptibility limits for the energy source. If the two uh, if the limits are below the energy level, then, then we've achieved safety. Uh, but if the energy level exceeds susceptibility, then we're going to have to do something about it. 
So that's what safeguards do. Safeguards reduce the energy transfer to tolerable levels. They don't cut it off completely, but they reduce it. Important thing to understand is that harm can be manifest later on after the exposure to the energy level. Um, people might be thinking here chemicals and, uh, and, and um, uh, harm to health and that sort of thing. Well, that's one aspect of it. But even for electric shock, if you receive a major electric shock, say from mains, um, really, even if you walk away from that without scratches or, or burns, you still should see a doctor about uh, uh, getting assessment because you've received a major electric shock. And equipment standards such as IEC 62368 are minimum requirements. There's a lot more you can do that are not actually in that standard. And they're in regulations, they're in uh, engineering documentation, they're in uh, scientific evidence as to what might happen. So you've got to evaluate all that. The limits in the standards are based on many years of experience. So this table here, trying to indicate the interrelationship of everything that we're talking about in this paper. So this is probably a good one to pin up on your wall. Um, all the hazardous energy sources that I talked about before are there. They're, again, they're only hazardous if the energy level exceeds the, the tolerance limit, the susceptibility limits of the body part or the um, flammable materials. Uh, we need to assess how likely is the hazardous energy going to transfer to the to different people or susceptible materials. And when we achieve a tolerable energy transfer, we've got what we call safety. And the way to reduce that tolerable energy transfer is to consider all the operating conditions that the equipment is working in and apply different kinds of safeguards to limit the transfer to tolerable levels. Now we see here there's a bunch of different people who are actually protected to different classes of energy. Uh, ordinary people or everyone who can touch the equipment have the greatest level of protection. Class two energy sources, we'll talk about that in a sec. Uh, instructed persons and skilled persons can access those. And class three energy sources are uh, really need only a skilled person to access them. Um, we go around that loop quite a few times doing risk reviews and assessment. And while there's still an unacceptable residual risk, we've got to go back through the loop and do it again. So as many times as it takes to reduce it to acceptable levels. Energy source classes, basically this, this is a very high level helicopter view of what's in the standard. Uh, the standard divides things up into class one energy sources and I'm trying to use traffic light colors to indicate the, um, the kind of risk level green for okay to touch. Yellow means it could be painful or ignition might be possible. And the red class three means you're very likely to be injured uh, and that injury could go all the way up to death in some cases. And ignition is likely and the spread of fire might spread to other parts in the building or the equipment uh, and could cause a major fire. So, um, We've got to consider the magnitude, duration, and body responses to those energy sources. To prevent the energy sources or limit them to safe values, we apply safeguards between the energy source and the body part or flammable material. And there's a definition from the standard as to what a safeguard is. It's a physical part or system that, or instruction, trying to reduce the likelihood of pain or injury or fire, uh, or for fire to reduce the likelihood of fire. So we've got a bunch of different classes of safeguards. We've got equipment safeguards, installation safeguards, and I'll deal with them here over on the right-hand side. Equipment safeguards are those things that are built into the product there. You, a lot of people call them intrinsic, but um, 
they don't rely on the user knowing anything about the product to provide safety. A basic safe guard is a first line of defense. A supplementary safeguard protects you if the basic safeguard doesn't work properly or if it fails or is defeated. And a double safeguard is a combination of basic plus supplementary. And a reinforced safeguard is equivalent to double, but all in a single safeguard. We've got installation safeguards, which is a characteristic of the building where the equipment's used really, such as protective earthing, fuses, circuit breakers and so forth. And you can have restricted access area where only authorised people are allowed to enter. Um, behavioural safeguards are things that change user behaviour, such as instructions on the equipment, uh, symbols, words, indicators, sounds that identify the hazards and change the user behaviour. If they don't, if they're not effective in changing use of behavior, then they're not effective safeguards. But the instructed person can use precautionary safeguards that'll allow them to access uh, parts of the equipment that might cause pain, but not injury. Uh, and the instructed person supervised by a skilled person. And a skilled safeguard is used by a skilled person who's been trained and educated and experienced enough to be able to identify all the hazards. Then we've got personal protective equipment, which um, if you really need like a skilled person or an instructed person might be likely to use those, but um, sometimes the ordinary person can use them in, in some situations. The electric shock risks, you know, people, <laughs> argue so much about voltage. And I, I, I just have to try and uh, help you understand that it's not voltage that causes electric shock. It, it, that voltage is, is, is a factor, but the main factor is electric current. And it's current through, through the heart, which is causing the most damage. And the amount of current can be affected by the contact area moisture, skin damage and how old somebody is. It can be affected by gender, uh, frequency and wave shape. All those sorts of things can affect the current pass through the body and the effect of current. I've shown two, two charts on the right. The top one is for alternating current and the bottom chart is for direct current. And they're from the IEC 60479 series of standards. And you can see here that from 60479, they've got different thresholds. The zone one, AC one or, or DC one, anywhere in that zone up to, up to curve A is, um, some people can actually feel that current. They can feel a current uh, of 100 microamps or more. Uh, not everybody, but some. And they might touch that and think, oh, I've received an electric shock, but in fact that hasn't done them any harm and it won't cause them any pain. Reaction is when you get to curve A on, on AC and your curve A on the DC curves, then uh, at that point you're starting to get um, involuntary reactions. You, 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 you might find some muscles pull and you, you might pull your hand away or it might push your hand towards the object, but they're involuntary reactions. Um, still usually not dangerous, often not painful. But then we get to the purple one or, or curve B, and that's the threshold of immobilization or sometimes called the let go or the inability to let go curve. So we're in zone three for that. There and AC and DC curves are different. Um, ventricular fibrillation is where you've got the risk of death. That messes around with the heart and the heart doesn't pump regularly, it kind of flutters or it doesn't usually stop, but it goes into a, a, a rapid fluttering that doesn't actually pump blood around. And that's why it's deadly. You get into curve C1, C2, C3 with increasing risk of ventricular fibrillation. And the further into zone four you get, um, the more possibilities there are of burns, breathing difficulty and cell damage. So, Bear in mind that all the 
touch voltage limits are derived from these touch current values. And that's been the principle right through IEC 62368 and pretty much any other safety standard. If they're not using those principles, um, there's a serious problem with the standard. Electric shock safeguards. Um, we talk, we can talk about insulation. There's a whole bunch of insulation requirements there. Um, many factors go into making insulation reliable. And that's pretty much what all these things are doing. But insulation can take many forms. It can be thin film insulation, can, can be compounds that you inject into components, can be coatings on printed circuit boards, can be liquid. Uh, such as a uh, transformer uh, insulating oil. It can be air itself as an insulator. And, and down here, we've got an example of air as an insulator between these two rectangular live parts. And we've got creepage distance along the surface between those in purple. And we've got clearance distances through air across that. And uh, if, if those two parts are hazardous, then you've got to put an enclosure around those if somebody is likely to touch them. Protective earthing is, is a safeguard, but it's a uh, secondary safeguard. The purpose of protective earth is to divert fault current away from the person, the user. Electrical enclosures prevent access to, to parts and um, components actually can be used as safeguards, but only if they meet specific safety standards and tests. And this last one, backfeed safeguarding battery backed up supplies. Uh, if you unplug a, a uninterruptible power supply and, and look at the power plug, you don't want the battery, the, the, the 230 volts generated by the battery for the equipment to be backfed to that exposed mains plug. So, so there's things like that that are all taken into account. There are a few other things as well. For electrical risk for fire, um, a fire can be caused at potential ignition sources. And we've got two kinds of potential ignition sources. We've got resistive PIS which is uh, where components heat through current flowing through the, through the component itself. So we've got arcing PIS where you've got a broken connection or um, when you open a plug or a switch or a relay contact, uh, or if you've got a dry joint in a printer circuit board for a component that's got a potential of more than 15 watts available to it, not a potential, uh, uh, an energy source greater than 15 watts. At less than 15 watts, you're not likely to have ignition. But if you've got between 15 watts and 100 watts, uh, it, there's limited growth and spread of fire usually. So um, that's can need to protect against the spread of fire, but, but it's less hazardous than when we get to PS3, you've got rapid growth and spread of fire. So um, we see here this TV example where a capacitor failure led to a, a fire that opened the back of the TV. Now, if there had been a curtain behind that TV set, uh, that could possibly have led to a house fire. I'm not saying that it, in this case it would have, but it could have. We've got a whole bunch of safeguards for fire. And... Um, basically by controlling the amount of energy and the temperatures inside the equipment, uh, controlling what kind of liquids you might have in the equipment and the flash points for those. And by use of non-combustible material or flame rated materials, uh, you can control the, the likely spread of fire and that. So if you've got PS1, the green stuff before, then you don't have to have any safeguards, but with PS2, there's a whole bunch of safeguards there that you can apply. Um, this funny looking cone shape, upside down ice cream cone confuses people, but there's a whole bunch of these in the standard. These are only two examples of, of many in the standard. 
It, they're trying to illustrate is you've got a potential ignition source and that could be a point source or it could be a, a, a wider component, say a, a, the length of a resistor. Um, the, the, the fire cone from that is defined as being up to 50 millimetres high and 13 millimetres in diameter and, and down to a, a, a half circle at the bottom. So anything within that vo shaded volume uh, has to be protected from, from flame. And so you have to keep flammable material away from there. If the flame is likely to go up to flammable material, you can put a flame barrier in there to divert the cone to the side. And so you can use a barrier or you can use a, um, uh, an enclosure for a fire enclosure. So there's, there's a, way, a couple of ways to deal with that. But for PS3, things where flame spreads quickly, um, you've got to meet PS2 requirements and mount things on flame rated uh, materials and you really need to have a fire enclosure. So um, that's fire enclosure is a big difference between PS3 and a, a PS2 and a PS3 safeguard. With PS2, you don't absolutely have to have a fire enclosure, but with PS3, you do. With materials and chemicals, uh, this is very different to the other energy sources in that uh, they're generally managed through other regulations and other standards in, in many countries. I've given a list there of a few things. And in Australia, we've got the, ACE, the, the Australian Industrial Chemicals Introduction Scheme and the Hazardous Chemicals Information System. Um, so we, the things we're trying to protect against are chemical burns to eyes and skin, organ damage, poisoning and breathing hazards. And there's other things that, that can be hazardous. So, but um, 62368 doesn't generally cover those other chemical risks, but the regulations certainly do. I've got a picture of button batteries there. You might wonder, well, is a chemical in button batteries a problem? Well, not really, but when a button battery is swallowed by a child, if it gets stuck in the throat, it causes a chemical change in the throat. And it's that chemical change in the throat that causes the throat to burn and can cause death. So even something as innocuous as a three volt battery can cause death and has. Uh, safeguards limit the quantities of the material. You might find alternative materials that have um, uh, less of a risk. You can uh, look at the container and the, the equipment that's holding the chemicals and the, how, how well is that storing those. Um, if the chemical is likely to escape from the equipment, and usually under fault conditions, uh, you might need personal protective equipment to clean it up. Or if you've got to refill something like a lead acid battery, uh, you might need PPE, glasses and gloves and uh, uh, other protection to protect against that. There's a bunch of different safety instructional safeguards that are used often on on things like batteries. You find these things in uninterruptible power supplies in case you're wondering. And uh, if we talked about environmental risks as well, so we there's lead in the batteries and we don't want to put in the general trash and uh, we can uh, hopefully re recycle the batteries as well to keep them out of the waste stream. Um, in some cases, chemicals can be emitted from products, um, uh, outgassing from plastics is one area where you get oh, volatile organic compounds uh, emitted into the atmosphere. Um, if there's a uh, flame inside the equipment, you can get smoke released to the atmosphere. And basically you need to limit those to safe levels and provide safe handling instructions for those. Mechanical risks, uh, 
seem simple, but this is another area of the standard which is actually quite extensive. There's, there's so many different ways mechanically that people can hurt themselves, it's hard to classify them. There are classifications for energy hazards, but it's just too complicated to put in this presentation. But mechanical risk can be uh, usually from kinetic energy transfer from equipment parts to a body part. Now that doesn't matter whether it's the equipment part that's moving or whether it's the body that's moving. So uh, you might put your hand on to touch something. If it's a sharp edge, that sharp edge might hurt you even though the sharp edge is not moving. Uh, parts can be ejected from equipment. Um, uh, an example of that can be uh, compact discs or Blu-ray discs. If they're not adequately contained in their tray, they can shatter from fracturing. And then uh, we, we've seen parts of those embedded in chairs, for example, and uh, we don't want that happening with people. There can be choking hazards if they're swallowed. This projector is an example of a recall. I've removed the um, uh, brand names from it. But uh, it's, it's a real life example of, of a product safety recall in Australia, where if it falls from the ceiling or wall, it may cause an injury. And um, we've got more examples over here. This example from uh, of a um, monitor mounting arm that mounts on the wall uh, was recalled in the United States where the, the, the mounting bracket can break off and the TV or the monitor can fall to the ground. So, so there's another risk there to bystanders. And this TV, I, I get chills every time I look at this. I know we're not using CRT TVs anymore, but there's still uh, uh, flat screen TVs can get very large and very heavy. And the same risk is there. What is the risk of TVs falling? Well, in Australia, We've got 11 deaths from television falling or television related falls in Australia since 2000. Sorry, uh, there's 27 total deaths for TV and furniture, but, but just where TVs are involved, there's definitely 11 deaths there. Uh, even one death is a tragedy. And um, the, the ACCC, is has a paper out now, an issues paper, looking at what needs to be done to minimise television risk of toppling and furniture risk too. Mechanical safeguards for for moving parts and 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 sharp edges. Again, they're very complex tables in the standard. Define MS1 as not causing pain or injury. MS2, mechanical uh, energy source two is painful but causes no injury. Uh, mechanical source three is injury requiring medical treatment. So if somebody's got to go to hospital or go to see a doctor, then, then that's a pretty serious injury. There's also reporting requirements in legislation if somebody's injured by a product that is reportable to the authorities in Australia and in many other countries as well. So you want to control the mass and the energy of the part. Um, you can control the diameter, elasticity and the shape. All these things have an impact on the risk profile of spinning parts. You can use interlocks to cut the energy level of the moving part before you access the part. Like if you've got a guillotine type thing, then um, cut the energy to the guillotine before you can access the, 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 the job underneath the guillotine. Um, for if, in some cases, if an MS2 moving part or sharp part needs to be accessible for the, for the job that it's doing, then you guard it as much as practicable and use instructional safeguards. And the same with an MS3 moving part, you've got to also guard it and use instructional safety safeguards, but it must not be life-threatening and it should have an emergency stop control close by. Um, 
so it's, it's, you, you, the users can actually access some some pretty heavy risk factors there, but uh, sometimes it might not be possible to to design equipment safeguards that prevent access to the risk where that equipment safeguard will also prevent the equipment from being usable. Um, but that has to be a, 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 an analysis done to determine what the risk factors are and what can mitigate all those risks. Um, equipment stability is another area of mechanical safeguards. Is it likely to fall down and hurt you? I talked about the TV examples. Um, when you lift the equipment, if it's heavy equipment, the handle's going to break off and uh, cause the equipment to fall on your foot or worse. Um, I've been in situations where a, uh, a, a one-ton transformer fell on a guy's head and crushed his head like a berry. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty important to make sure these things don't happen. Um, Mountings, when, when you mount the thing, we talked about the, the visa mount earlier for the monitor, but so when you mount something on a wall or on a ceiling or even on the floor, if it's going to rely on the robustness of the mounting to prevent it from tipping, then there's requirements in the standards for that. For carts and stands, they usually have wheels, so um, you've got to check how well they're attached. What happens if you bump over a little bump like a... Uh, a, a raised tile when you're moving the cart and the stand around, the wheel's going to come off. We don't want that to happen. Antennas, uh, we don't want people's eyes be poked up by a telescoping antenna. High pressure lamps, um, again, they can explode if they're not treated properly and got to simulate that explosion and check that the parts from the explosion are contained safely. And a work cell, if you're going into a hazardous area where equipment's moving, might be uh, manufacturing robotics inside a, a work cell, like a, a tape library, for example. Um, you might need, I need to lock in a key or a tool. You might need tag out and lock out procedures. Uh, visual indicators prior to restoring movement and an emergency stop system nearby. So, and preferably uh, with the lockout tag out procedures, maybe have a second person working with you. Thermal burn energy hazards. I won't go through the whole table there, but um, the injury depends on the temperature difference, the thermal mass of the object, the rate of thermal energy transfer to the skin and the duration of contact. And if we look down the materials list here, we'll see in it, uh, an increasing level of thermal resistance from these different kinds of materials. So th thermal transfer can happen more easily from metal than it can happen from wood. So if we look at some of these other numbers, you can have uh, uh, metal can be 70 degrees if you only touch it for less than one second, or it can be up to 140 degrees if you've got wood, because the transfer is... Uh, it has a higher thermal resistance. And uh, when you're touching something, the, the, the skin actually has a flow of blood underneath it, which can remove some of the heat from, from the initial touch. So let's say if you're touching that glass, what's the requirements? Well, glass and porcelain, TS1 for the ordinary person. If you don't need to touch the glass, 85 degrees C will be maximum. If you need to touch those knobs to adjust the knobs, how like, long are you likely to touch those for? Maybe this area, 10 seconds to a minute, uh, in which case TS1 for, for a metal knob will be 51 degrees limit. Uh, for a plastic or a rubber knob will be 60 degrees. So that's how you use a table. And if you go above TS2, you're, you're, you're into TS3, which you're not allowed to touch. Or body-worn things like your, your digital wristwatches and that, in contact with the skin, there is no TS2 limit. You're basically not allowed to have a TS2 limit for body-worn devices. The safeguards, 
of a thermal energy transfer, uh, use a basic safeguard for pain and use basic plus supplementary for, for uh, against injury. And um, sorry if I'm rushing a little bit here, but there's still more to go through. Um, they can control the amount of energy, apply heat sinks to components. You can have cooling, uh, forced air cooling systems or um, convection cooling systems if, if that works. Um, you've got to be aware with, with some of these cooling systems that if the cooling system is blocked in some way, then the part might heat up under uh, abnormal operating conditions higher than, than you expect. Supplementary safeguards, uh, such as instructional safeguards and warnings that the part may be hot, don't touch. But again, you have to remember that those safeguards must be effective. And for parts that require heat for intended function, they must be unlikely to be touched during operation or maintenance and they require an instructional safeguard and warning and must be unlikely to be touched by children. Now, what could those be? They could be, uh, for example, the fuser module on your laser printer. Um, they can take quite a long time to cool down, but if you want to change the, the toner in your laser printer, you might hatch actually, uh, it might actually make the fuser module accessible when it's still too hot to touch. So you can use warnings there, but in that case, it must be unlikely to be touched by children. Whoops, gosh, what happened there? Radiation. Radiation risks, are where mostly we deal with non-ionizing radiation and I've got some frequency limits in there from uh, International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection. I always get a bit tongue-tied with that. ICNRP. And it's a generic term, non-ionizing, that describes electromagnetic radiation that can't cause ionization of atoms or molecules. And it also includes uh, uh, audio waves, uh, mechanical waves. So uh, that's why the standard has acoustic sound radiation limits in it as, uh, under radiation injury risks. There is some X-ray uh, from equipment such as cathode ray tubes, and uh, there's some limits there for the cathode ray tubes. We'll talk about those in a minute. The acoustic sound radiation protection is provided for personal music players, but not for other audio sources such as your telephone or, or, um, or your, your, your stereo amplifier with loudspeakers and that sort of thing. Um, so other sources, radio frequency, electromagnetic energy, uh, radioactivity, ambient acoustic, ultrasound, etc., managed in regulations. Need to consider those in considering your risk controls, but they're not dealt with specifically in this standard but exposure to lasers and lamps is definitely covered in this standard. Looking at laser and lamp safety, there's two main standards that apply to that. IC602, sorry, got the numbers back to front there, 60825. You always find an error after you publish. <laughs> and IC62471. Um, gosh, I'll have to correct that in the, uh, after this. Uh, the lamp radiation limits for exempt group and sometimes uh, risk group one apply where the radiation is not needed to be accessible for the function. Um, so to achieve that, you can use an enclosure to prevent access to the radiation. That enclosure must be opaque to that radiation. Uh, in some cases, you might be able to see through the enclosure and you think, oh, I can see through this. But it's the radiation that potentially hazardous that it needs to be opaque to. And if there's any ultraviolet emitted by the lamp, you've got to make sure that the uh, enclosure is resistant to that ultraviolet. 
So like I said, you can't see ultraviolet. So you might have a glass platen there that prevents ultraviolet coming through. Um, but the uh, glass has to be opaque to the UV. Use instructional safeguards if you have to access uh, uh, lamp radiation in excess of those limits. But uh, where used by the ordinary person, we can't have risk groups three and we can't have uh, for lamps and lamp systems and for lasers, we can't have class 3B or class 4. Those are particularly hazardous. Not even the instructor person is allowed to access those. There are laws in place around the workplace and general public that could have additional or extra requirements. And there's a new standard under development for lasers, which is a risk-based safety standard covering things like uh, lasers intentionally directed to the eyes or the face like uh, VR headsets, gesture tracking and facial recognition systems. That uses a failure modes and effects analysis, but that's only the first draft is coming out of the committee, international committee at this stage. It'll probably take a year or two before that's developed into an international standard, but you've got to keep watching that space. X-ray energy sources, nobody's allowed to access anything above RS1 in X-rays. And if you have RS2 or RS3 behind a removable cover or door, then uh, you've got to have an instructional safeguard on there to, to warn that um, the skilled person could be exposed to that, but you're not still not allowed to expose the ordinary person to that. So this is a skilled person access area only for those levels. For personal music players, uh, edition three of the, the standard has alternative RS1 limits. The, the original limits in edition two are based on the energy source exposure limits, so 85 dBA or 27 millivolts uh, uh, limits, so depending on how and what and where you're measuring. For um, the, the newer requirements, so you can use either the, the exposure or the dose measurement, that's the calculated sound dose is 80 dBA for 40 hours. So if you calculate the equipment can't produce more than that, then you've met RS1. For RS2 levels, you can go up to 100 dBA for, or 150 millivolts at the uh, electrical interface of a headset or 10 dBFS or um, uh, digital or cordless listening devices, and RS2 exceeds that. There's a bunch of things not included, but we're really only talking about here, portable audio, audio visual equipment intended for use by the ordinary person while walking around, um, uh, body worn while walking around. So um, the, some of the safeguards, you have warnings, you can have, uh, if you can exceed the limit for RS1, then uh, you've got to have user acknowledgement that they're going to exceed that limit. And remember the, the limits are for 40 hours exposure in a week. Um, so you can go above that limit for short periods, but if you go likely to go above 100 dBA, at all, ever, then uh, you've got to have another warning there to the user that uh, that they're getting into quite dangerous territory. The exposure time for 100 dBA is 15 minutes a week or less. Um, if you've got dose management systems and optional controls such as parental control, you've got to provide inst instructions and those controls must not defeat any safeguards. You supply headsets separately to the uh, personal music player, then these are the requirements for analog or digital headsets. And you also need to recognize that sound other than the equipment is contributing to the person's daily sound dose, such as work, transport, you catch a train, look, stand by a roadside where there's trucks and heavy traffic concerts, clubs, cinemas, etc. All these things contribute to your daily sound dose. So 
people can still have hearing loss even if they stay under the RS1 limits. But they've got to recognise that these other things do add to the sound dose. We can't measure that. And if the equipment is for use primarily by children, there may be toy standards requirements for the sound level in those. So if you, putting all that together, that covers all the risks and, and the, 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 the a summary of the kinds of safeguards you need against the risk. So if you built the product to comply with all of that, uh, you want to go and sell this product now, well, you still got a whole bunch of things to do. And this chart, every box on this table is a, is a um, field of study in itself. <laughs> it's, it's, this is what made it quite difficult to condense this presentation into one hour. <laughs> because by the time you do all these things, um, everything in this box has to be attended to before you can go to market. So you've got laws and regulations governing uh, selling products and uh, getting, getting uh, compliance tests and certification and laboratory accreditation for products. You've got corporate social responsibility and there are some laws and regulations about those, but there, there, there's also ethical requirements as well. If your company's got a good name and seen as an ethical company, um, you've got a whole lot of, um, of company uh, reputation on the line to make sure that your products are safe. Uh, once you do go to market, you've got to keep watching what's happening in the market to see whether or not the product is performing as, as expected. Um, it might not. You might have to go back uh, through your quality systems to check what's happening in the marketplace. Are there any needs for recalls? Has there been some allegation of non-conformance to a safety standard? Or has there been an allegation of somebody being injured by a product? Uh, there's recalls procedures for that. If you go into a voluntary recall, there's laws and regulations about that. Uh, before you can put products on the market, for many cases you need approval. You may need to register the company and the product and you may need to put approval marking on the product. And the, the regulators are watching what's happening. So all of these things lead up to liability for your product. If something goes wrong, uh, liability doesn't stop when you ship the box. So um, regulations can change, standards develop can change, and, uh, and uh, technology changes. You've got to watch everything that's happening on the market, make sure you keep up with those changes. And if there's an exposure on your box that you become aware of after you go to market, you may have to consider whether that is serious enough for a recall or whether you have to change a manufacturing line to bring it into compliance with the new standard or recertify it. You've got to go through all those things. So it doesn't stop once the product has been shipped. Conclusions, uh, users do have the right to expect their products are safe during normal use, abnormal use, reasonably foreseeable misuse, that's not every kind of misuse, and fault conditions. Laws impose obligations on suppliers to meet minimum standards and regulations, but meeting those minimum standards and regulations doesn't guarantee that the product is going to be safe enough for the community that is using the product. So there's a value judgment that has to be made there. Corporate social responsibility fills in residual exposures not explicitly covered by laws and, uh, and standards. So if you have a thorough understanding of the energy hazards that can cause pain and injury or, or fire, um, and, and you have a thorough understanding of the safeguards that can minimise the risk of those bad things happening, then uh, that's essential to ensuring that the product that you put onto the market is safe. So thanks very much for your attention. Um, I'm hopefully we've got some time for, for questions, but um,
Uh, I am available if you want to send some questions offline. Um, my uh, email address was in slide three. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul, for your uh, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed. Um, so in line with, um, actually, I myself have a question. Is it okay if I ask? <laughs> yep. So, so um, I mean, it's, I mean, the safety is actually a very interesting topic area. And um, yeah, my background is mainly on, um, just give it a little bit of a background. My background is on cybersecurity. Yeah. And I am really interested on um, finding the impacts of any cybersecurity issues on the physical safety of human beings. So how could the digital information can cause um, hazard for, for, a, for a real person? Just, I mean, in, in one of your slides, you actually mentioned about mechanical safety and, and also you mentioned about the augmented reality and VR headsets that, I mean, it's now getting more and more of those type of, um, you know, devices nowadays that they have a lot of applications and um, they can potentially put people in more risk. I mean, you mentioned about sharp edges. I mean, if you imagine this VR headset, or let's say augmented reality headset, superimpose some digital information on the physical you know room that you're you're actually at and then you don't see the, the sharp edges then it can harm your physical safety um, so when we talk about me i mean these are some type of mechanical safety i mean i understand you mentioned uh, about electrical safety uh, radiation and they are kind of let's say uh, maybe easier to formulate what safety means with respect to, for example, for electrical safety, you mentioned about the current uh, threshold and, and for radiation, we have certain threshold to determine what is safety. But for mechanical safety, how do we define mechanical safety? Um, uh, I, I tried to, I wanted to show that, but again, I was trying to fit the presentation into a one hour format. Right. Um, where the, the, there are energies, mechanical source, uh, mechanical energy source classifications, MS1, MS2, MS3, which I, I mentioned briefly. Right. Um, uh, on. Uh, slide was it this slide here right okay ms1 can't cause pain or injury ms2 painful but no injury in ms3 which is injury requiring medical treatment now there are limits in the standard for the energy of moving parts so uh, the, the, they are quite well defined in the standard i see there, there are limits in the standard and, and many tests in the standard for the uh, uh, reliability of, um, of slide rails, for example. All of these things, equipment stability, carts and stand stability, slide rail security, high pressure lamps, work cell enclosures and all that. Each have a, a section in the standard which is quite extensive and, and the MS3 limits are specified for each of those. When we get to um, uh, stability like falling TVs, um, mechanical energy source MS1, MS2, MS3 is defined in terms of the weight or the uh, uh, mass of the equipment. And so uh, there's tests for that, and there's tests to make sure that the equipment such as TVs or monitors can't slide on, on a glass surface, which is probably one of the smoothest common surfaces in a property that, that, that it might be put on, so that uh, it won't slide off and fall and, and hurt somebody. Um, there's requirements for putting, once you've met MS2 or MS3, if it's classified as that by either weight or by the mechanical uh, energy behind a moving part, 
then the requirements in the standards specify what you need to do to safeguard against contact with those parts. So, um, uh, for example, if you've got floor standing machine, uh, which might be your uh, airport um, uh, ticket uh, check-in uh, kiosk, for example, at the airport, um, they would usually be bolted to the floor so that people can't move them and they'll fall over and hurt somebody. They're quite slim. They usually have small bases and, and big tops. So unless they're actually well secured to the floor, they can cause an injury. Um, and we've all seen the, the monitors that are mounted on ceilings and walls in shopping centres and projectors in cinemas and theatres and that. So there are many different kinds of mechanical hazards. They are classified in the standard, but it was just too difficult for me to put those classifications into a, a simple foil in these slides. Thank you, Paul. That makes sense. Um, so I think we have also one more question from Mike Johns. Yes. Uh, he asked, um, are the IEC is still working on acoustic hazards from telephone equipment? Uh, the answer to that is no, unfortunately. That's where we originally, and Australia was a, a key player in getting acoustic requirements into the standard in the first place. Uh, they weren't in the first edition of 62368, but they did get into the second edition because of Australia's lobbying the committee to get that in. And um, we started off on the premise of uh, acoustic safety for telephony equipment, but before TC 108 was formed, the committee was called TC 74, responsible for IEC 60950, which was a preceding standard. And they tried to get acoustic safety for te telephones into that standard. Um, and they were roundly defeated. Mainly the objections were that the acoustic safety requirements covered occupational health and safety, and that was regulated around the world anyway. So they didn't see a requirement. And some people argued that it wasn't up to TC74 at the time to write those standards anyway. So the advisory committee on safety in the IEC gave the to another committee who basically just sat on it for years and did nothing. And then when Australia came along and said, what are you doing about it? Uh, we found out that nobody was doing anything. Uh, so we introduced acoustic safety for personal music players because that was topical at the time and not covered by occupational health and safety regulations. And there were many reports around the world of kids and, and teenagers and young, young adults losing their hearing or, or having uh, hearing loss as a result of listening to these things too long, for too loud. There were no guidelines anyway. So we introduced those to the standard. Again, it was very political to get the IEC to release the work from the other committee and let TC 108 handle it. But that's what we went forward with. And uh, yeah, the current requirements are, as I said, either exposure limits or or um, calculated sound dose limits, and probably edition four of the standard, which is well developed now. We're up to edition three that's published, but edition four is well under development, and uh, we may find that the ex exposure limits get removed and only the uh, dose limits retained for acoustics. So there, there is still some work going on there, but not for telephones. Thank you, Paul. Um, we also have another question from Raymond Alvarez, and um, he's asking uh, for USB cables. Is the IEC, I mean, is this, I mean, safety a standard for USB cable IEC 62680, or is it IEC 62368? So which one is more suitable? Uh, in terms of product safety for USB cables? For USB devices, the uh, 
appropriate standard at this time is IEC 62368-3. Um, but that standard is, is kind of new and not a lot of countries are using it just yet, although it has been regulated in Europe, so Europe is using it. Uh, the third edition of 62368-1 references the part three standard, uh, but it doesn't make it mandatory. So if you meet 62368-1, um, it doesn't specifically cover some of the unique issues with power delivery over USB and other communications circuits. So, but that standard is there. Remember I said, you've got to look at the whole environment that, you, that, that the equipment's working in and under corporate social responsibility, if you identify that there may be a risk in a USB product, uh, you really need to look at part three of the standard and, and how that might apply to your product, uh, even if it's not mandated by government regulations. Oh yeah, thank you, Paul. I mean, there was a correction from Raymond and my apologies for my mistake. He meant um, USB cable, he meant not the USB devices. Um, so he's asking about the standards related to USB cables. The, the cables aren't specifically covered in this standard, only the devices, the power source equipment and the powered device are covered by 62368-3. Uh, in Australia, the, uh, and the same applies to telephone and uh, communications type cabling, those aren't specifically covered in our standard. They're regarded as external circuits and the standard has limits as to how much energy you can put into external circuits like that but it doesn't actually specify requirements for those circuits. Um, so you need to look at the cabling standards for, for the safety requirements for those cables. Thank you, Paul, for um, answering the question. I really appreciate um, that you just gave us your precious time for delivering this um, in very interesting talk. I think now we are almost the end of our session today. Um, once again, I would like to thank everyone for joining this session today with us. And um, I would encourage everyone here to stay tuned. We have more interesting news coming up in the future and we will circulate um, the events among you so you can join us. Thank you, Paul, for your interesting talk. And uh, I hope you have a good day with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ali Reza. I appreciate it and the opportunity to present this. and. Uh, as I said, if people want to contact me uh, afterwards, uh, I'm happy to take simple, uh, 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 basic questions, but uh, I just can't answer specific questions about particular products. Uh, I need to keep things uh, generic to what's in the standard. I can't interpret or solve specific problems for people. That's not my role. Yeah, yeah, thanks Thank so much, Paul. Thank you. I think everyone has your LinkedIn profile. I think it was inside your biography. So if anyone wants to stay in touch and ask more questions, they can contact you there. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.